Step 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Throughout our recovery, one of the things which stands out as a result of our working the steps is our success in building a relationship with the God of our understanding. Our initial e efforts resulted in the decision we made in the third step. We continued by working the following steps, each one of which were designed to clear away whatever barriers might stand between our higher power and ourselves. As a result, we are open to receive our higher power's love and guidance directly into our lives. For many of us, the characteristics of our disease and the things we did in our act of addiction separated us from our higher power. Our self-obsession made it difficult for most of us to even believe in a power greater than ourselves, much less achieve conscious contact with that power. We could see no purpose or meaning in our lives. Nothing could begin to fill the emptiness we felt. It seemed as though we shared no common bond with others at all. We felt alone in a vast universe, believing nothing existed beyond what our limited view allowed us to see. Page 106. However, once we be begin to recover, we find our obsession with ourselves diminishing and our awareness of the presence of a higher power growing. We've begun to see that we aren't alone and never have been. Through working the previous steps, we have already achieved a conscious contact with the God of our understanding. Our separation and isolation have ended. In the eleventh step, we now seek to improve our conscious contact with the God of our understanding through prayer and meditation. Many of us had trouble understanding the meaning of praying for power in the eleventh step. At first glance, this seems to contradict the most basic aspect of our recovery program, our admission of powerlessness. But if we take another look at the first step, we'll see that it says we're, we're powerless over our addiction, not that we won't be given the power to carry out the will of God, the God of our understanding. We did begin at a point of powerlessness in the first step. We were powerless over our addiction and incapable of carrying out any will but our own. This doesn't mean we gain power over our addiction in the eleventh step. In the eleventh step, we pray for a particular kind of power, the power to carry out God's will. We no longer shy away from spiritual growth because it has become so essential to maintaining the peace of mind we found. Perhaps at the beginning of our recovery we worked the steps because we were in pain and afraid we would relapse if we didn't. But today we are motivated less by pain and fear, driven more by our longing for continued recovery. This leaning toward recovery reveals that we've surrendered more completely. We've reached a state where we actually believe that the will of a power greater than ourselves is better for us than our own will. It has become second nature for us to ask ourselves what our higher power would have us do in our lives rather than attempting to manipulate situations so they happen according to our ideas of what's best. We no longer see God's will for us as something we have to endure. On the contrary, we make a conscious effort to align our will with our higher powers, believing that we'll gain more happiness and peace of mind by doing so. This is what surrender is a heartfelt belief in our own fallibility as human beings and an equally heartfelt decision to rely on a power greater than our own. Surrender, the stumbling block of our addiction, has become the cornerstone of our recovery. However, we cannot recover on surrender alone. We must build on our surrender by taking action just as we have in the previous steps. In the tenth step, we, begin to, we began to practice the discipline required to live spiritually on a daily basis. We continue practicing this principle in the eleventh step by persisting in our efforts to take action each day. We place prayer and meditation high on our priority list. We resolve to make prayer and meditation as much a part of our daily routine as eating and sleeping, and then we employ the necessary self-discipline to achieve our resolve. Page 108. To work this step, we must also increase the courage we've developed in the previous steps. Though the courage we demonstrated when we honestly and thoroughly examined ourselves was beyond anything we had previously experienced, we now need to develop a markedly different form of courage. We need the courage to live according to spiritual principles even when we are afraid of the results. Despite our fear, we do what's necessary and draw on the endless well of courage we can find by tapping into a power greater than ourselves. With all this discussion of God, we may again find ourselves growing uncomfortable, perhaps wondering if this is where the religious catch we've anticipated is going to be revealed. We may wonder if our sponsor is now going to inform us that we must pray or meditate in a particular way. 
Before we get carried away with such fears, we would do well to remember one of the basic principles of recovery in Narcotics Anonymous, our absolute and unconditional freedom to believe in any higher power we choose, and of course, our right to communicate with our higher power in whatever way conforms to our individual beliefs. Although some of us practice a traditional religion, only rarely do we hear specific religious beliefs discussed in our meetings. We respect the rights of our members to form their, form their own spiritual beliefs and tend to frown on anything with potential to dilute the spiritual message of recovery. Page 109. In this encouraging atmosphere, most of us find it relatively easy to discard our preconceived ideas of the right way to pray or meditate. Finding our own way is another matter. We may have a basic understanding of what prayer and meditation are, praying being the times we talk to a higher power and meditation the times we listen for a higher power's answers. We not, may not be aware of the many options that are open to us. Searching those options out and exploring their usefulness to us can become uncomfortable and time consuming. It is only by being open-minded and by taking action that we are likely to find what is right for us as individuals. We may experiment with a whole assortment of practices until we find something that doesn't feel foreign or contrived. If we have found that everything feels strange, then we practice a form of prayer and meditation till it no longer seems unnatural. Many of us have adopted an eclectic approach, borrowing our practices from a variety of sources and combining those which provide us the greatest comfort and enlightenment. We are on a spiritual path which will lead us to a greater understanding of our higher power. Many of us have remarked on the great joy we find along the way. We are sure to get help from our fellow members or perhaps even from others who are also walking a spiritual path. Seeking out these individuals and asking for their guidance can help us find our own answers. However, sharing in another's experience does not excuse us from the need to seek our own. Others may be able to show us the path they walked, page 110, sharing with us the joy and insight they found along the way. Nevertheless, we may find our spiritual paths taking a different turn and have to adjust our method of travel accordingly. In the end, we find what's true for us in moments of personal contact with our higher power. The experience shared by others is just that, experience, not ultimate answers to the mysteries of life. Our understanding of a higher power grows and changes through prayer and meditation. We find that it is too limiting to define our higher power in such a way that our understanding is set in stone once and for all. An interesting parallel can be drawn if we remember the times we've thoughtlessly tossed other human beings into categories and left them there. We deprived ourselves of an opportunity to know someone else on a deeper level. Treating our higher power as something to be defined will rob us on a grand scale, halting further spiritual growth the minute we arrive at an absolute definition. In addition to the open-mindedness so necessary to working the 11th step, it is vital that we actively pursue knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry it out. This knowledge is what we are searching for when we pray, whether our prayers are desperate pleas or calm requests for guidance. Regardless of our state of mind when asking for guidance, we can sh be sure that our consistent efforts to seek knowledge of our higher power's will for us will be rewarded. We should remember that step 11, step 11 asks us to pray only for knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out. Just as we opened our minds and avoided restricting our understanding of our higher power, we avoid placing limitations on what God's will can be for us can be. Page 111. Though the temptation to pray for a particular result may be great, we must resi resist the urge to do so if we want to experience the rewards of the 11th step. Praying for specific solutions to specific problems is not the answer. For instance, at some time in our lives we may feel unhappy but not know exactly what is causing such an unhappiness. After spending a few minutes in prayer, seeking a specific solution to our unhappiness, we may suddenly get an idea that all our problems are caused by our boring job and demanding boss. We may even go to great lengths to convince ourselves that our idea was divinely inspired. We, as addicts, are subject to take such random thoughts and run with them, impulsively quitting our jobs. This scenario may seem extreme. Its point, its point is that, by praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out, we can avoid our former tendency to allow fleeting whims and superstition to dictate the course of our lives. Knowledge of our higher power's will does not usually come in a momentary blinding flash but in a gradual awakening brought about by the continued practice of prayer and meditation. Practicing the 11th step involves a daily discipline of prayer and meditation. The discipline reinforces our commitment to recovery, to living a new way of life, and developing further our relationship with our higher power, page 112. Through this daily practice, we begin to glimpse the limitless freedom we can be afforded through God's love. 
We have found that following such a discipline also results in a firm belief in our own right to happiness and peace of mind. We see that, regardless of the presence or absence of material success in our lives, we can be content. We can be happy and fulfilled with or without money, with or without a partner, with or without the approval of others. We've begun to see that God's will for us is the ability to live with dignity, to love ourselves and others, to laugh and to find great joy and beauty in our surroundings. Our most heartfelt longings and dreams for our lives are coming true. These priceless gifts are no longer beyond our reach. They are, in fact, the very essence of God's will for us. In our gratitude, we go beyond merely asking for the power to live up to God's plan for our lives. We begin to seek out ways to be of service, to make a difference in the life of another addict, to carry the message of recovery. Our spiritual awakening has opened us to the spiritual contentment, unconditional love, and personal freedom. Knowing that we can only keep this precious gift by sharing it with others, we go on to step 12.